I request Professor Mundal Bhargo to come and give his chief guest speech. Chairman Dr. Pawan Goenkaji, Director Bhaskar Ramamurtiji, members of the Board of Governors, the professors, administrators, and staff of IIT Madras who are present here today, and of course, most importantly, the 2015 graduating class of IIT Madras, and their families. Thank you so much for your warm welcome, and lots of congratulations to all of you. It's really a great honor and pleasure to be here today with you on this grand occasion at this incredible institution of higher learning, IIT Madras. Even though I was born abroad, like any Indian, I grew up hearing about the legend of IIT. I had a number of uncles who had gone to IIT. Not so many aunts. Hopefully that will change in the coming generation. And my uncles and their classmates and batchmates would often speak of the magical and legendary school that they went to called IIT and the ways in which it profoundly changed their lives. They would tell us about IIT as if they were magical wizards, telling us ordinary muggles about Hogwarts. <laughs> we kids would all sit in awe and say our oohs and ahs as they shared their out-of-this-world experiences. They were so proud to be IITians, and understandably so. These amazing experiences of my IIT and relatives were later coupled with a news story on a popular program called 60 Minutes. Probably you all have seen that. On this program, Leslie Stahl explained to all of us that IIT was like Harvard, Princeton, and MIT, all rolled into one. Moreover, we were informed how US Ivy League schools served as backup schools for IIT students. Wow. <laughs> The legend of IIT continued to grow in our heads. <laughs> so when I came of college age, being in the United States, IIT wasn't really an option. And so I went to what was the next best option, probably a school that was a backup school for many of you, Harvard. <laughs> and then I went to another one of your backup schools, Princeton, for my PhD. In other words, I went to two-thirds of the right side of the equation, IIT equals Harvard plus Princeton plus MIT. So I still hadn't quite reached the level of an IITian. <laughs> and while I received excellent educations at both of these, edu uh, both of these institutions, uh, I could not help wonder, how much could I have accomplished had I gone to an IIT? <laughs> Provided I could have even gotten into an IIT. <laughs> What would life have been like for me had I received an IIT degree? I could only imagine. Until now, I can now stand before you and say, I'm finally receiving a degree from IIT. <laughs> so this day is not just momentous for all of you, but it's also momentous for me. Of course, I probably don't have to tell you, you are all so lucky to be graduating from IIT Madras with actual IIT degrees <laughs> and not just honorary ones. All of India and all of the world looks up to these degrees and what you have accomplished to earn them. You have one of the best engineering and STEM educations that anyone can have, not only due to the fantastic teachers and courses and facilities that you had here at IIT, but perhaps most of all, due to the amazing fellow students that you had the opportunity to work with and spend time with. As I know from my IIT and relatives, you will hold on to these friends and collaborators forever. And you will forever be inspirations to each other as you each find your unique paths and adventures in life. The question is what you will do with the unparalleled education and degree that you have received here. You have the ability and technical know-how to excel in whatever field you wish to pursue. But what I want to urge you today is to not be satisfied just with excellence, but rather aim for greatness. In other words, don't just do what is expected of you, 
But do more than that. Be innovative, be creative, and go beyond what people thought was possible. Of course, that's much easier said than done. The subjects of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, these subjects can be taught. But creativity and innovation are things that cannot really be taught, at least not directly. As artists often say, creativity cannot be forced. It happens when it happens. So the best we can try to do is to maximize the probabilities that these moments of creativity and innovation do occur. Because sometimes one such moment of inspiration is all it takes to revolutionize one's field. And in rare cases, that one moment of inspiration is enough to change the world. So what does it take to be innovative? I thought I would talk to you today briefly about four things that I believe one can do to maximize the chances that such moments of inspiration, creativity, and innovation happen. And maybe even happen often. These four things have worked for me, I think, to some extent. And so I hope that if I pass them on to you, perhaps they may work for you to an even larger extent. And even if they don't work, I guarantee that they will make your lives far richer and more enjoyable in any case. OK, so the first thing is learn from the masters. This point is pretty clear. And it's something that you've already been doing to some extent. Your teachers, your textbook writers, they have all been masters. But I don't just mean masters in the conventional or popular sense. Find your own masters. If there's something that interests you, then see who has done or accomplished something in that realm that excites you, however long ago, and try to understand what they did and how they did it. For me, I always wanted to do explicit number theory. Two of my heroes in this area growing up were Brahmagupta and Gauss, who lived 1,400 years ago and 200 years ago, respectively. I didn't just read the various modern accounts of their works, but I read them in the originals, or at least close translations of the originals. These readings allowed me to really get a sense of what drove them. This was very inspiring to me and had a direct influence on what I would work on later. Of course, the point here is not to do exactly what your heroes did, but to be inspired to find your own way of thinking and your own approach to the subject. And that brings me to the second point, which is you want to think differently than those before you. Think outside of the box. Think in ways that people haven't before. Part of the reason that you're going to, you want to learn about what people did previously is to know that that's not the way you want to think. <laughs> because if you think in exactly the same way that others have been thinking, then you're not likely to come up with something that others haven't already come up with. So instead, develop your own perspective as you learn your subject. Your own viewpoint, your own analogies, your own interdisciplinary connections. Your own totally different approaches to difficult problems. If you think of people who revolutionized fields, like Ramanujan, or Einstein, or Steve Jobs, you immediately see that they were thinking very differently and outside the usual box. So how can you get yourself to think outside the box? That leads me to the third and fourth things that you should do. First of all, you want to explore for exploration's sake. In other words, don't necessarily start with the problem that you want to solve. But instead, just explore related things that interest you for the simple reason that they interest you. Follow your nose. You may soon end up in territory that people have never considered or investigated before. Often when I think about mathematics, I'm personally not thinking about any particular problem. I'm just thinking about what is most exciting to me at that moment. The problem being solved emerges only later. People often say later, wow, that was a creative solution. <laughs> but I didn't actually know what I was doing when I started. I was just having fun. And that is how pure scientists work. Many pure scientists work that way. They use their intuition to guide them to exciting places and only examine how it might be useful afterwards. Some of the greatest scientific discoveries happened in this way. And I'm hopeful that many of you will get to experience this joy, this adventure, as future scientists and innovators. 
most explorations don't lead anywhere. That's something I should definitely say right away. Most explorations don't lead anywhere, of course. Most ideas fail. <laughs> so remember that a single success is all that it takes. And so never be afraid to fail repeatedly in your explorations and to learn from and indeed be inspired by those failures. I say that from personal experience. Uh, so finally, how can one fine, fine tune one's intuition and creativity when exploring? And thus be able to recognize when one is nearing something truly new or useful. And th that brings me to my last point, and I believe this is key, which is we should learn about art, learn about other fields of human endeavor, and search for unexpected connections among these various fields of human endeavor. I mentioned that creativity can, in general, be hard to teach explicitly. But art is the closest one can get to a subject that explicitly teaches creativity. Most of us here today are engineers and scientists, and we have worked hard to develop the left analytic side of our brain. But it is important to develop the other sides of our brains, too, to become complete creative people. And that is what art can do for us. I often talk about how when I'm stuck on a mathematics problem, I might go and play the tabla for a little while. And then when I come back, things in my head have often cleared. And I make progress. Art can get one's mind moving in a different way to stimulate the creativity in the other side of the brain. And why learn about other fields of human endeavor? Why do you need to know about disciplines that seemingly have nothing to do with the job that you will work in? Well, first and foremost, it greatly enriches your life. It broadens your outlook if you are able to appreciate worlds that are outside your own. Secondly, there are often countless unknown, yet to be discovered connections among all fields of knowledge. And one never knows when an idea or concept from another discipline might improve or even completely transform the work that you are doing. Indeed, many of the world's greatest innovations and breakthroughs have occurred due to such cross-fertilization of ideas across seemingly different fields. X-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, and lasers in medicine all originally came about due to physicists and space scientists thinking about these things for completely different reasons. In some cases, the immediate purpose was just to have fun and play around, because that's what pure scientists do. Radiocarbon dating in archaeology, anthropology, and history is another example where ideas from physics and chemistry resulted in a revolution in a completely different field, quote unquote, completely different. Uh, on a lighter note, one of my favorite toys, Rubik's Cube, was discovered by Rubik in a totally different engineering context. And only later did he realize that he had constructed one of the greatest puzzles in history. As I talked about here yesterday in this very room, music is another subject that has incredibly interesting influences from and influences on many scientific areas. Psychology, physiology, sociology, engineering, physics, and mathematics. Central concepts in mathematics and engineering, such as recurrent sequences, binomial coefficients, generative algorithms, error correcting codes, and more, were first discovered in the context of poetry and music. These stories about these incredible connections, well, they're very beautiful. And they've always inspired me, as they gave fundamental examples of simple ideas in one subject that eventually grew into concepts so omnipresent, important, and deep in another. And such stories still happen today. Steve Jobs was famous for his ideas for products that combined together top-notch aesthetics with top-notch engineering. When asked about why the Macintosh computer revolutionized computing, he remarked, I think part of what made the Macintosh great was that the people working on it were musicians and poets and artists and zoologists and historians who also happened to be the best computer scientists in the world. Many of the world's greatest new com companies and startups continued to follow this line of thinking. So I want to end with one last example of a highly successful integration of a variety of disciplines 
including arts, mathematics, humanities, and science, by a person who was very close to my heart and who I lost this year, who we all lost this year, one of my inspirations in graduate school, and later a good friend and colleague, Professor John Nash. His famous theory of equilibria and non-cooperative games was not only a masterpiece of mathematics, but also contained extremely artistic ideas and constructions that were built on phenomena in neighboring disciplines. As a result, his work had major influences on numerous subjects, including economics, evolutionary biology, artificial intelligence, law, diplomacy, and politics. Professor Nash personifies the notion that a simple idea in one subject can have profound effects on other areas. Professor Nash will be truly missed, but it is clear that his legacy will live on strongly and forever. In summary, to be creative, learn from the masters, think differently and outside of the box, explore for exploration's sake, and perhaps most importantly, learn about and search for connections across different fields of human endeavor. Like Professor Nash and all the other heroes I've mentioned, find a number of things that you really enjoy doing and do them. Keep learning about other disciplines and don't just appreciate the connections between different fields of human endeavor, but actively search for them because they are definitely there. And use all of these wonderful experiences, these things you enjoy and these connections to well, find a job, <laughs> but beyond that, to do inspired work, to have fun, to make new friends, to take care of your family, your friends, and others. And of course, to give back to your institution, your community, your country, and the world. Congratulations again, IIT class of 2015. I can't wait to read about you in the news, as I'm sure I will. And best wishes for a very exciting array of future endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Bhaga, for a very entertaining, inspiring, and insightful speech. As I had mentioned, that Dr. Bhargava is an accomplished mathematician, and accomplished mathematicians innovate new equations after a lot of research. So I like the equation that you have innovated today. IIT equal to Harvard plus Princeton plus MIT, right? I don't know why you left out Stanford. <laughs>